Hello and welcome to PC RetroTech. So in today's video we're going to be playing and analysing this game from 1984 called Zaxxon. Uh, so we're going to be playing it on this IBM PC 5150. Uh, so that came out in 1981 and the game itself is 1984. Uh, the PC is uh, 4.77 MHz, it has an 8088 processor in it and they were sold in either 16 or 64 kilobyte models although this one has been upgraded uh, significantly and the amazing thing about the game Zaxxon is that it's very small, it's only 20 kilobytes and that includes all of the graphics uh, the gameplay and the code to run the game and the other interesting thing about it is that it's in isometric pro uh, projection so you can see that the assets scroll onto the screen at about a 60 degree angle here and in fact the name itself Zaxxon comes from the fact that an isometric uh, projection is a type of projection called an axonometric projection so Zaxxon axonometric so that's just a little fact and you can see that this is actually a really very playable game. Uh, so initially this was designed to run in uh, an arcade where you go down and play games on big machines that were set up uh, with the games on them. And of course Sega made a lot of money out of this. It was a very popular game. Uh, and it was later ported to a whole lot of platforms including the PC. So you can see it here running on an original IBM PC and it's really remarkable that uh, they were able to do such a good job and in this video, which will be the first in a series of videos analysing uh, various games and how they worked, we're going to talk about why it was such an incredible achievement to be able to run this game in not only a small amount of memory uh, but also uh, so smoothly and playably for the day. So the main obstacle that you'd have to overcome when writing games in this era was just the general slowness of the CPU. So as I said, the 8088 was at 4.77 MHz, and if your game had fairly complicated graphics that needed to be drawn out pixel by pixel, uh, this is roughly what you could expect it to look like. Uh, so I'm just updating every pixel on the screen here, one pixel at a time, and you can see that it's taking a number of seconds per frame. So clearly games in the era weren't doing this because uh, this is just unplayable and it would be too slow. Uh, if you could take advantage somehow of some special structure in the graphics that you were trying to draw, uh, so for example in uh, this next demonstration I take advantage of the fact that I'm drawing lines vertically on the screen. Uh, if you're prepared to write assembly language specifically for that special case, then you could get things to run quite a bit faster. So you can see here that uh, we're still getting uh, worse than one frame a second, uh, but it is an improvement over uh, just doing things pixel by pixel. Uh, this is still too slow, of course, and it's not actually the monitor that's the problem here. So the monitor refresh rate is 60 hertz, and in fact, the CGA graphics adapter would uh, write whatever was in the graphics memory uh, 60 times a second to the screen. So that's not where the delay was. The two delays were the speed of the processor itself, the CPU in the system, and uh, also the speed of the, uh, the, the memory, the CGA memory in the CGA adapter. So you can see the limitation from the CGA memory if I simply write uh, as quickly as possible to all of the screen memory. Um, so I'm going to fill all the screen uh, with bytes all of the same color uh, in this next demonstration and it doesn't look much faster but that's only because I'm only updating the color here every 16 frames so in fact we're getting 10 frames a second here uh, I just didn't want it to flicker too much so I only update every 16 frames and I'm literally pushing a byte at a time which is the maximum this processor could do uh, although the 8088 was a 16-bit processor in terms of its register size, uh, its data bus was only 8 bits. That's what the 8 stands for in 8088. Uh, the 8086 had a 16-bit data bus, and that's what the 6 stands for. 
so here I'm only pushing one byte at a time and you can see that it's uh, around 10 frames a second so that's the limitation of the screen memory itself that's how fast you can write to it so the second disadvantage that you had in the CGA adapter is that it didn't have more than one screen buffer so in the VGA adapter which came later uh, you could do 320 by 200 graphics uh, actually in 256 colors which is another advantage uh, you could do that kind of graphics with uh, two screen buffers in screen memory so one of those buffers would be visible at any one time and the other one would not and so you'd use the one that wasn't visible to draw your uh, characters or your sprites uh, and to compose uh, the picture that you wanted to display and you could take as long as you wanted to do that because all this time uh, this is the only buffer that's visible and then you would do what's called a page flip which would switch from uh, the right hand buffer being the visible one to the left hand buffer being the visible one and so the picture that you'd spent all that time drawing would finally be displayed and as that one is visible this one is not and then you could draw the second frame uh, in the uh, invisible buffer and when you finish with that then page flip again and then it would become the visible frame and so on uh, so this was called page flipping and it just wasn't available in the CGI adapter uh, there wasn't enough memory in the adapter for this uh, memory was expensive at the time of course and it just wasn't a feature that the hardware itself supported so another limitation that you'd have to work around to do with CGA adapter is the refresh rate of the screen itself. So that was at 60 hertz, and so that means it was updating 60 times a second, but you know that you can't draw a frame in a 60th of a second. So imagine that you're trying to do some smooth animation where you want to move a figure across the screen. The way this is done is you draw the figure, then you black it out, and then you draw it in the next position and you black it out and you draw it in the next position and you black it out and so on. Now the problem with this, if you were doing it visibly uh, on the screen, is that all of that blacking out and drawing would be shown in real time and it would present inconsistent information to the eye. One moment the pixel is blue, the next moment it's black, and then it's blue again, then it's black. And this would lead to an ugly flicker effect. So you couldn't do this uh, in the screen memory itself. And remember, that's all the CGA adapter has, is just uh, the ordinary screen memory, which corresponds to what you're seeing on the screen. So the way to work around this was something called double buffering, where you would set aside in main memory uh, a second buffer where you could actually uh, compose your image before putting it on the screen. Now, of course, that implies that once you finish drawing a frame, you then have to copy the whole frame over to the screen memory. So that's going to take some additional time. So it's actually going to slow down your frame rate rather than speed it up. Uh, but it was necessary when doing animation. Otherwise, you'd end up with this really ugly flicker at whatever speed you were drawing frames. In order to increase the frame rate, you had to make sure that each time you drew a new frame, you were making minimal changes to the screen. So that meant that you really couldn't have very large portions of the screen being changed at any one time. You'd have to only update uh, very small objects, small sprites, uh, small little characters that are being animated uh, or something like that. And games typically used a whole slew of techniques to keep the amount of updating that needed to be done very small so that the frame rate could remain high and they used this double buffering so that you wouldn't get any flickering uh, associated with blacking stuff out and redrawing it into the new position. So if we look again at Zaxxon uh, we can see that it's actually scrolling very smoothly. Now notice that the little ship itself really isn't moving relative to the screen but almost everything else is. And you might wonder how on earth can they do this quite so fast, given all the limitations that I've just talked about. Even with double buffering, which will get rid of any flickering, uh, they've still got to draw these frames. And it seems like everything is moving here. So more than half the screen needs to be redrawn each time. Or does it? 
So if we go back to the start of this run here, it is a little bit deceptive. It does look like everything's scrolling across here because of the way the first part of the track here moves towards you. But if you look a little bit closer during the main part of the game here, the only things that are actually moving here are little sprites. The blue and purple regions that are there are not changing at all, and so no update needs to occur for those pixels. The only bits that are actually being redrawn each frame are the little uh, towers and turrets and missiles and so on. So these are actually very, very small parts of the screen. The other thing that you'll notice, uh, you can actually see this because this is real hardware, um, that there's about four and a half frames a second here. So it's not really exceedingly fast. Uh, it still seems playable because everything's moving quite smoothly. Uh, but in terms of frame rate, it's only four and a half frames a second uh, or thereabouts. So what I'm gonna do next is I'm actually going to slow it down and we're going to see if we can spot any tricks that are being used uh, in the way uh, things are actually being updated. So the first thing you can notice when it's running slow like this is that there are some artifacts. For example, here in this right hand upper corner of this brick, uh, you can see that it's not quite drawn properly. And that makes me lead and that leads me to the conclusion that everything's drawn as square blocks of data, uh, which can of course be written to the screen much faster. You'll also notice that uh, not all of the objects on the screen seem to be updating at the same time. And it's not really clear to me exactly what's going on there. I don't know whether that's an interaction between my camera and the screen or it's simply the, uh, the electron gun on the screen moving down so that um, during one portion of the sweep, uh, you have one frame displaying and the other portion of the sweep, you have the other frame displaying, uh, or whether it's actually something intrinsic to the game itself, uh, where the game is actually updating the top and bottom of the screen separately. I don't really know the answer to that. Uh, but in a moment here, you'll see that the shadow and the, the actual ship itself are handled slightly differently here. Uh, you can see that the ship is actually just displaying over the top of uh, this other sprite. And the reason they can get away with that is because if the ship was right over the sprite, it would crash into it and that would be the end of the game. So they can make a lot of assumptions about their sprites, uh, about which sprites are going to actually be updated and which sprites are not going to be updated uh, as they're going. Um, so those are the basic observations that you make when going through the graphics here. So the next thing to notice is that the sprites actually don't ever go off the edge of the screen. Uh, so it, instead of actually just disappearing under the edge of the screen, as you might imagine, uh, they're only disappearing under the bar that lies across the bottom of the screen and the bar that is on the left hand side of the screen. I think this has been done on purpose because if you have a sprite that needs to be sort of partially displayed on the monitor and partially not on the monitor, you have to worry about um, which pixels need to be actually drawn to screen memory and which don't. You can't just draw them all because the ones that aren't actually on the screen are going to be written to memory that isn't screen memory and could actually even cause the computer to lock up. Or worse still, they might just wrap around and end up being displayed on the other side of the screen. So you'd end up with half the sprite on one side and half the sprite on the other side of the screen or the top and the bottom respectively. So I think these bars at the left and the bottom are actually there as a mechanism to prevent that from happening. Uh, when a sprite disappears off the left or the bottom, uh, the bar at the left or the bottom of the screen is then written over the top of that uh, before the image is then put into the screen memory. So just to summarize how I think everything's working here, I think that uh, as much as possible if the screen is not being updated and the very large objects and the sort of static sprites, if you like, the ones that are moving along with the track are all 
uh, square blocks uh, that are being drawn, uh, and they're dr being drawn very, very rapidly. The only parts of the screen that are updating every frame or that need to be changed every frame are the effects. Uh, so the little zigzaggy lines that you see here and the, uh, the missiles exploding and uh, all of the um, things that are moving around on the screen, those certainly need to be dealt with as ordinary sprites. And so obviously they need to have specialized code for handling those. Uh, but everything else is just drawn as blocks on the screen. And I think that there's a, a lot of assumptions made about uh, the layering, so the order that sprites appear on top of one another, uh, which uh, actually make it a lot easier to draw everything rapidly. Uh, of course, the track itself, I think, is not being updated. Uh, that's all just one big long blue section with a, a pink uh, bit at the bottom and uh, only the plane and the missiles and so on are actually changing in each frame. So hopefully you enjoyed this little look at uh, this classic game from back in 1984 and enjoyed the analysis of how it actually works. Uh, hopefully in some later videos we'll actually implement some of this technology, uh, especially sprites and animation and so on. Um, so if you're interested in that sort of content, please subscribe. Uh, don't forget to put the little notification bell on below uh, so that you get notified when uh, videos get uploaded. And we'll see you in a later video. Bye.